Hi everyone. For those I uh, haven't met me before, my name is Tim Sunrike. Once upon a time, I went to this fine institution uh, long before many of you were born. <laughs> not, not, not quite that bad. Although I did, uh, when I did Austral's trials the other day, I did say to, to one of the people who was in my room, um, she was asking me about you know, when I first went to a tournament, uh, and I told her the year that I first went to, a, to an Australasian, and she said that she was five at the time, um, which, which hurt me in ways I didn't know I could be hurt, but <laughs> growing old is a wonderful thing. Okay, let's talk about uh, first principles of economic development. Before that, I want to talk about first principles, because uh, I'm going to assume that there is at least one person in this room who doesn't know what that means, and if I have any mission at all in life, it is to eradicate that one hand waved at the back that doesn't know what it means. So, uh, hands up if you have uh, read the training guide or watched the video that tells you what first principles is. Hey, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Did you put your hand up for saying you didn't know what it was? Okay, great. <laughs> All right, so we don't have a huge amount of time given the amount of stuff needs to get through, so I am going to try and race really, really fast. Uh, that's what I do anyway, because I do everything at the speed of light, but luckily it's being recorded, so if there's bits that don't make sense, um, you know, go back and watch the video. Also, um, I'm going to do a hell of a lot of name dropping. That's not to just be gratuitous and sound smart. I would hope that my awesome facial hair makes me seem smart anyway. Uh, the reason why I'm going to name drop a hell of a lot is because if you hear things that you don't quite understand or you think, oh, that sounded all right, but I don't really know how I'd actually explain that, then having the name of the person whose idea that is is just an easy Google search away from finding more information. I can't tell you everything in one night, of course, uh, and you are mildly... Uh, it is assumed that you'll do a mild amount of your own research if you want to, I don't know, be Victor Finkel. So... Uh, let's get started. What is first principles? Someone who's read the training guide. Make my night. Tell me what first principles is. So it's how you do debates when you don't actually know anything about the debate. So you figure out who you are and then figure out what that thing or person will be. Fantastic. It's also how you do debates when you do know stuff, by the way, as well. <laughs> but it's most appealing to people when they're at the stage where they don't know very much what to do. So first principles is just a way of organising all of the random bits of information which you will acquire through, you know, reading magazines or newspapers or watching TV or watching other people debate or whoever it is that people learn things, so that you don't just have piles and piles of bits of paper with facts on them, which, believe it or not, is what people did for a long time. They would cart huge amounts of paper, piles of paper, in folders with, you know, everything I know on Iraq in a series of, like, plastic sheets, uh, which was incredibly useless because it meant that when you needed to know a particular piece of information or a particular argument, you had to sort through all of that stuff to find it. But, of course, you can't memorise all the things you know either because if you did, then you wouldn't need to be here having this conversation. So, first principles is the middle ground. It says, yeah, it's great to know stuff. In fact, it's critical to know stuff. If you really want to be in that top 10%, top 1% of debaters, you want to win tournaments and take trophies home, you've got to know lots of stuff. But it's really hard to learn lots of stuff without a filing system, without some way of kind of organising that information and figuring out how it relates to each other, because if you're just trying to learn what's a good example of this argument for this particular topic in this particular debate, then you need to learn a lot of things. But if you learn, here's an argument which applies to all of these kinds of debates, and I can use it as all of these kinds of examples, then that one piece of information becomes useful in a whole variety of places. But you have to learn how to recognise how one thing can be consistent with a lot of others. So it came about uh, in part because an old mad debater named Kim Little had this crazy idea one day over too many glasses of wine that there was only really like maybe half a dozen different kinds of debates. That was her idea. They're all kind of the same, right? Like they're all, when you really boil it down, the kind of clash in them, they're all basically the same. And we started trying to list them, what would be the half dozen kinds of debates. And unsurprisingly, we got past more than half a dozen. But we got to a number, and we didn't get them all, but like we stopped at a point where we were pretty confident that there was more than half a dozen, but there probably wasn't more than a few dozen. Which is actually not that many when previously we'd been operating on the assumption that there were hundreds or thousands of topics that were all kind of different, that we'd have to learn the details of all of them. But to only learn the details of a few dozen things over the course of a number of years at uni doesn't actually sound that hard. And when you compare it to other things you might be doing, maths, chemistry, science, politics, you're going to learn dozens of other things as it is. Uh, adding one more on the list doesn't hurt that much. So let's talk about what it means in practice. I think first principles comes in three forms. Basic first principles, intermediate first principles, and advanced first principles. We're basically going to talk about the first two of those tonight, and I'll try and do a little bit of advanced first principles if we get time. But um, as the name implies, uh, you generally only need that for really, really high-level debates when you're against really, really excellent opponents. You can get a very long way on just the basic and intermediate stuff. So what's basic first principles? Basic first principles is just the simplest way of boiling down the clash in the debate 
to being a kind of theoretical clash. So it's turning debates into algebra, right? Once you strip out all the content, it doesn't really matter what the words are. We're talking about country X or country Y, it doesn't matter. We're just talking about a country and a situation and a challenge and a problem and how we're going to deal with that. And if you can think about how that debate is structured at its most basic level, then you can already start to see certain types of debates. So anyone who's read my training guide want to tell me what is one kind of basic first principles? What's one category of debate that has lots and lots of different topics that fall under that same very basic clash? Yep, ban versus regulate is good one. So lots and lots of debates. Doesn't really matter what you're banning or what you're regulating, right? Might be gambling, might be drugs, might be prostitution, might be all sorts of stuff, might be porn, blah, 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 blah. You can get on the list. Doesn't matter. At a fundamental level, they're all the same debate. They're all saying there's this thing which people are doing. To a greater or lesser extent, we don't like it. So what is the best way of trying to reduce the amount that that thing happens? Is the best way to reduce the amount that that thing happens by making it illegal to do that thing, or is it by trying to control the way in which people do it? And then you insert the facts, right? Because it's different whether it's guns or whether it's you know marijuana. But the types of arguments you make will be the same. Just the kind of examples and analysis you build on the end of them will obviously have to suit the topic you're talking about. But you know what those arguments are. If you've done one of those debates, you've effectively done them all, and you know the kinds of facts you need because you knew what kinds of facts you used. In the gambling debate, so you just need to know the versions of those arguments for the drugs debate. What's another example of basic first principles? Trade-offs, trade right? So a trade-off is the kind of debate where both sides kind of agree that the other team's got a point, right? That the thing they're arguing for, it's not a bad thing, and that maybe in a perfect world, you'd kind of have both, right? But you can't because the nature of the debate is it's a zero-sum game. You have to choose between having this thing or that thing, or more of this thing and less of that thing. So how are you going to make that choice? Right? That's kind of trade-off debate. What's the alternative to that? Anyone? Exclusivity. Well, I call them values debates, but it's the same thing, right? It doesn't really matter what you call them. Values debates are where you say, no, I don't at all agree that the thing that you want has any merit to it at all. It's a terrible, bad, dumb thing. And we shouldn't do any of that. We should do all of what I'm saying. <laughs> right? So I had a set of slides about this, and the trade-off debate is like, you know, uh, how do you cut up a cake? And, um, and the uh, values debate one is like a lightsaber fight. Right? <laughs> like it's where all that ambiguity stripped out. Right? We're on top opposite sides here. One of us is going to win. One of us is going to lose. No ground to be given. No quarter asked. We're just going to fight to the death. Right? So what's an example of a values debate? What's the kind of topic where the two sides will take positions that basically assume that the other side has got it totally wrong? Rehabilitation versus mm, No, I think most people think that there's kind of a bit, a bit to say both ways. It's just about which way you go. Yeah, we can't have both. Yeah, but the outcome you want is kind of the same. You still want, you still want to get to a point where that situation is resolved. Yep. Legalizing jewels to the death. Yeah, okay. I think we're, we're missing some more easy, obvious examples. But, but sure, that thing from the, from the 1500s is right. Yep. Religion. Sorry? Religion. Yeah, debates about religion or anything where one side is, you know, basing arguments off the kind of things you think religion might be. So, you know, a debate like abortion is a classic one, right? Where imagine the kinds of debates where in society you don't see people politely talking to each other, you see them screaming and hurling abuse at each other. Those tend to be the kinds of debates that are values debates because the two sides come from just totally different worldviews. They kind of have nothing in common with each other. They can't possibly understand why someone is so mistaken and misguided as, as they might be. But in other kinds of debates, um, you know, the, the, the people will recognise the trade-off. Right, so the classic debates about trade-offs are things like um, effectiveness versus um, efficiency. Right? And so if you think about that in a government sense, right? everybody wants a government that's effective. No one wants a paralysed government. I mean, just, I'm talking in theory here, not about specific governments. But everybody wants a government that can do stuff. Otherwise, it's a bit of a waste. Right? But at the same time, we all want a system that's accountable. We all want to know that we can be heard, that bad stuff doesn't just get rammed through, that stuff gets explained to people, that there's enough time to understand it. So that's why in Australia, for example, we have, in most states and territories, two houses of parliament. Right, we have the lower house where the government gets formed and the upper house where decisions get reviewed and, and exchanged. Right? And that's explicitly about making the trade-off. If you want a system that's more efficient, if you want a system where it's easier for the government to do what it wants to do, for better or worse, 
then you get rid of the upper house and you just have one house. And Queensland does that and uh, the territories only have one chamber. Right? And uh, lots of other countries only have single, single chambers, right? And the argument there is they're saying, yeah, we get it. Like, this accountability thing is important, but we think we've got enough accountability. What we want now is more effectiveness. And in those kind of countries where you've got two different houses, and in those countries like the US and France and stuff, where you effectively have three levels of government because you split the executive out from the legislature, they're going more in the direction of more accountability, more representation, less effectiveness. Right? Now, it's not obvious which of those is better. It's just that you have to make a decision about where to draw the line. You can't have one and a half, one and a half houses of parliament. Right? You have to decide how many you're going to have, and you have to be able to justify that. But it's not that people who have systems of government that have two houses of parliament think people who only have one house of parliament are totally insane. No, they're not totally different world views. Now, I'm going to teach you another one that's not in my training guide, um, which is pretty good fun, I think. And the debate we just did, did everybody do dictatorship versus democracy? Yeah, right. So, that one just happens to be an example of this kind of first principle. Uh, I've never had to do this thing before. Oh, yeah. Black. Black? Okay. Hey. See, I'm learning things. Journey versus destination, right? Lots and lots of debates are journeys versus destinations debates, right? So, in a journey debate, what you're saying is we all agree on the destination. We agree where we're going, we just don't agree on how to get there. Right? And in a destination debate, you say, we don't even agree where we're going. <laughs> right? You want to go over there? I think we should go over there. Right? See how they're kind of like the trade-off values debates, but they're a bit different. Right? So if you're the kind of visual person, you know, a uh, journey debate is where we start from here, we want to get to here, but we just disagree on the path. Right? And that's the debate. Which of these paths is the right way to go? Uh, and if you're not, if you're in a destination debate, then that's the debate. Right? Where are we trying to get to? So, what's an example? Well, let's talk about feminism. Lots of feminist debates fall into one kind or another. So, affirmative action debates. Affirmative action debates almost always have the feature of both teams will agree that the destination is right. The destination in affirmative action debates is greater representation of women, whether that's in politics or business or whatever it is you're setting AA quotas for. Right? It's very rare that one side will say, no, 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 we think uh, having very few women in the corporate boardroom or in the halls of parliament is a good thing. Right? They might, it's possible, but it's very rare. But the two sides will say, we both want the same outcome, but we have a fundamentally different approach for how to get there. One side has a top-down view where the government creates mandates and requirements and that pulls women up. And the other side has a, a bottom-up approach that says, no, no, women have to find their own path and it might take longer and it might be messier, but that's the way we think it's, it's, it's done best. Right? But you don't bother arguing about the destination. Both sides will probably concede in the first minute of each of their first speaker speeches that they want the same outcome. Right? But other debates, uh, people disagree more about um, the definition, about the, the destination. So if we talk about things like prostitution, People might actually agree or disagree about the destination. So the destination for a prostitution debate is about, starts from the question about is prostitution inherently bad? If it is, if we both agree that it's inherently bad, then it's just a debate about how do we best minimise that harm. Right? So we're agreeing on the destination. But if we disagree, if one side says we start from the premise that prostitution is bad, it's bad for women, it's bad for society, and so our purpose is to eradicate it. And the other side says, we don't actually have a problem with prostitution. We think it's a legitimate form of work, it's a legitimate industry, and we'd like to see it be well regulated, like we do every industry. But we don't think the perfect world is one where it doesn't exist. We think the perfect world is one where it's well regulated, well paid, the women are protected, conditions are good. See how they're going in different directions? There's very little for them to agree on. And that changes the nature of the debate, right? If you're in a destination debate, you have to argue both about why your destination is right as well as why your path to get to that destination is effective and right and the best approach. But if both sides already agree on the destination, then you skip that and you go straight into the details about why you've got the best way of getting there. Right? So it changes the kinds of arguments you make. So recognising that in the prep 
is going to save you a lot of time or avoid missing developing a set of arguments which you need and which you won't have and have a missing link. So that's why it's basic first principles. You won't win the, the debate with it, but if you miss it, you have a very good chance of losing the debate. Now, intermediate first principles is more complicated. Intermediate first principles is saying, all right, I know the kind of clash it is at that sort of high philosophical level, but that only gets you so far. At some point, you've got to know some stuff. You've got to be able to talk about that thing. You've got to have some information about prostitution or AA or whatever the topic is. So how am I going to know what kinds of arguments, what kinds of positions I can be? Before uh, first principles is described as knowing who you are, and that's one of my favourite phrases in adjudication, right? It's knowing who you are in the debate. Because if you know who you are, if you know what kind of people you are and what kind of interests you represent, then the arguments just fall out. Because you know what kinds of things you're trying to defend, what kinds of things you would agree to and what kinds of things you would have to disagree to. But if you don't know who you are, if your case is just a collection of arguments, then you might find that your arguments are inconsistent. And you won't know quickly whether an argument your opponent makes is one you have to rigorously attack because it's central to the logic of your case, or it's something you can just say, yeah, we're fine with that. That doesn't actually mean anything for our case. We can completely accept that argument is true. But it doesn't matter because all these other things are also true, which changes the nature of the debate. So intermediate first principles, I think, always exist on a spectrum. So you're going to see a lot of these over however many years I get dragged out here to do these things. And in simple terms, intermediate first principles usually means that there are three positions in the debate. And those three positions, usually you only need to know what one of them is and you can intuit what the other two are. Right? You can guess, because the one that's on this side, the one that's on the far edge of the spectrum, whether it's on the left or the right, the one that's on the opposite side will, by definition, have some mirror-imaged views of the other side. Right? They'll differ from that view by taking values-based differences. And then the middle section of the spectrum tends to take some parts of both. Right? Sometimes not an equal amount from both sides, but takes some of the elements of both sides. So once you can identify one position, even if you don't know for sure, you can usually guess and you can know what you're looking for. You can say, well, I know that there's this kind of argument, so I'm going to go researching to find what the opposite of that is. What are the people who hate those people? Who are they? What do they believe? Why do they hate that argument? So what does it mean uh, in the case of development? Well, let's jump back a step. Let's ask a question. What is development? What does it mean? What does it mean to have a developed economy? What does it mean to live in a developed society? What do those words imply? What do those things look like? Um, high standard of living. High standard of living, yeah. That's a contestable phrase. So like something a bit more objective. People being rich, having money, and also being able to do things with that money. People being rich is certainly very important, yep. Access. Access to. Yeah, opportunity, it's not part of everyone's definition of development, but yeah, I think it's in there. Um, to establish like administrative and technological infrastructure. For what end? The production, export, and business. Right, exactly. So you know when you're flying over a developed country, if you're looking out the window of a plane, because it's got lots of industrial infrastructure, right? It's the kind of country that can make lots of stuff. And, predict, and generally speaking, lots of advanced goods. Right? Not core commodities, not basic stuff, but manufactured stuff, refined stuff, enhanced stuff. Yep. Uh, the extent to which a state can make human rights, so whether that's on a basic level, like you know, political rights, or whether that's on a, uh, you know, like a third generation level, like gay rights or environmental mm. So that's very interesting, and we're going to come to a version of that. But see, the difference between that and the kind of materialistic definitions is Lots of countries qualify for that materialistic definition, right? Lots of countries, the one we're sitting in right now, have lots of stuff. Lots of rich people, lots of productive capacity. We use high technology to produce in mass volumes and apply layers technology. But once we get into third generation civil rights, there's probably not very many countries that tick that box. So we go from a different world, right? From a world we think we're in right now, where it's very clear that there are lots of countries that are developed and lots of countries that are not developed and a little bit of arguing about who's in the middle. To pure definition means, I don't know, maybe some, maybe none. Countries are in the developed category and others aren't. So clearly the most conventional definition is one that involves around the material infrastructure 
material wealth definition, right? Because we talk about the world being full of lots of developed countries. But this is a very good point, um, and we're going to come back to it, so stick a pin in that. Can I ask a question? Sure. Sure. Does this mean that not only is there journey debates and destination debates, but there are also debates where we might disagree about goals, and that's then vital to figuring out you need to make both sets of arguments as well? Have I, yeah. Exactly, which is a point I'm about to make in about four minutes. So thanks very much. No, no, it's great. You're spot on. You're exactly right. So. Let's just go back to what, what development means. So if we take this, this definition, which is the standard kind of textbook definition that you literally get in economic development textbooks, that development means modernisation, it means mass production, it means material wealth, then that implies that there's a certain path to development. Right? The countries start off, we, all countries started off in a, what we might call a traditional state, in a state where we, they didn't have any of those things, they couldn't mass produce things, there wasn't high amounts of wealth, there wasn't high amounts of material consumption, and they progressed through various stages of technology and production until they got to the point where we have iPads and fly around on planes and or we'll have a car and everyone's got a television and doesn't think that's particularly exciting. <laughs> and there's a version of that argument, right? There's a guy called Rostow, and Rostow's got the classic model of development, which you'll see in every textbook. He's got what he calls the five stages of development. I won't bother drawing them because it's not that complicated of a chart, right? But it's basically, a, there's various versions of it, but it's basically a simple chart that's got this kind of nice, smooth, upwards curving line and five stages on it. And he says, this is how countries develop. They start at step one, which is the um, traditional stage. They go to step two, which is the preconditions for development and investments. This is before countries are actually starting to get wealthy, but they're starting to put things in place that would help that. They're starting to create the basic infrastructure and the basic human capital that you would need for someone to want to invest in your country. So they're making sure they got reasonable amounts of electricity and some vaguely decent roads and a mildly educated population. And that's enough for someone to want to start a factory in your country. Then they move to the third stage, which they call takeoff. Right? Once you've got that infrastructure in place, then investment pours in and everybody wants to take advantage of the things that you've got going for you. And then from there, you move up to the fourth stage, which is acceleration to maturity. Right? Listen to the language. Right? Acceleration to maturity. When we talk about maturity, we're implying that, that the alternatives are immature, right? that they're childlike, that they're not quite at a serious level. Right? Maturity is a positive thing. Maturity is something that eventually most of us, although not Stephen, but you know, everybody else, <laughs> is going to one day get to for the greater good of all mankind. Right? And then the last stage is, the last stage is high mass consumption. Right? The last stage is America. <laughs> and, and when we look at and when we look at countries that have developed, and we look at Britain and America and Australia and Canada and those countries, you can see versions of that, of that process, right? We can argue about the stages of them and what the preconditions of them were and whatever, but some version of that has happened. And so then when we look at countries today that are developing or that have been developing in recent times, if we look at Asia and Africa, basically, and Eastern Europe, we can see some countries are at different points along that scale, arguably. And so if you're in the orthodox camp, if you're a standard development economist, you're asking yourself which stage, essentially, in those five points is a developing country at and what do they need to do to get to the next point and the next point. But there's a lot of inbuilt assumptions there, right? And the biggest one is that there's one destination, that development has a real clear image, that there aren't multiple kinds of development, that development is when we're all really rich in dollar terms, not rich in cultural life, right? And we're all really rich in a monetary sense, and we've all got shitloads of stuff, and we live in a house, and we have high material consumption, and that's fed by an economy which produces lots of stuff, because that's how lots of people get lots of stuff. That's a very clear image of what a developed country looks like. But not everybody's going to agree that that's the definition of development. And so, to go back to the point made before, in, in a second, sec. if you're in the debate, either because of the topic or because of the decision that you make as a team, sometimes the topic forces you to do one thing or another, but sometimes you get the choice, you get to decide whether you're going to accept that orthodoxy or challenge it. And in lots of debates, people are going to accept it, right? In the debate that we just saw, that um, strong dictatorships are better than weak democracies, I only saw one of the debates, but I'll bet dollars to donuts that every room had implicitly or explicitly the assumption that the aim of development was to get to Western liberal democratic advanced economic standards. 
Now, I'm not saying that is a bad thing, right? That's totally fine. That's a strategic decision. That's a first principles decision you need to make to decide what's the best place for us to go. Is this the cleanest, strongest argument for us to make? And if it is, then make it. It's fine. It's a debate. You want to win it. But you need to know that there's a choice there. Okay, question. Very often. So, the most classic, most famous uh, assault on the orthodoxy of development, although oddly enough he still kind of comes back to the same point, but the most famous assault is Amartya Sen, right? Nobel Prize winning Indian economist. I'm going to talk all about India today. I'm going to use a lot of Indian economists except one, and the one I'm not going to use is Korean. The one on the Indian is Korean because you know white people are stupid. So, I'm going to talk about <laughs> people who have come from developing countries because they probably know a thing or two about development. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is Amartya Sen, right? And he challenges the orthodoxy by saying, that the assumption that's built in to that Rostow's five stages and all the more modern versions, some people have disavowed it, but still come back to the, essentially the same point. The assumption that's built into that is that the economics comes first. Right? That tribal societies and traditional societies don't have a lot of human rights. Right? They don't have a lot of political freedoms. They don't have a lot of uh, opportunity to get an education and a lot of built-in healthcare. Right? And you don't get that in the early stages of development. Not like in the Industrial Revolution, England wasn't drowning in public hospitals and free schools. Right? It got those things later. It got rich, and then it rolled that wealth, that first stage of wealth, into social services, which elevated the health and education of its people, which took it to the next step of where you need people who have PhDs to make tertiary economic products. But you can get a long way by just having relatively uneducated, fairly unhealthy people toiling away in factories. But you can get a long way, but at some point you want to take the next step then you have to invest in that stuff. But Amartya Sen says, well, that's kind of bogus, right? Because not only is that a kind of ugly vision, that surely any society that considers itself advanced and developed, what that must mean when you boil it all down is that that society is free and the people are free. And by freedom, he's not talking about the you know, gun-toting American version of freedom, which is whatever Obama thinks is good is bad, right? He's talking about all the classic freedoms. He's saying the freedom from want, right? Knowing that you can never not have enough to eat. You can never not have adequate shelter. You can never not have the health care you need. But freedom of opportunity, right? Having enough of the basic skills and having the capacity to access employment and other opportunities. And political freedoms, the right to express yourself, to form associations, to challenge power, and to hold power to account. If you don't have all of those things, then by what right would you call a society developed? And so if that's the end point, if freedom in all of its glorious forms is what we're aiming for, irrespective of whether we're rich or not, although that might be a part of it, but that's only a means to the end. If the end is the freedom, then why would it be that we only get that right at the end? So he says, not only is having those freedoms the end goal, it's also part of the means of achieving development. So we need to have those freedoms from the earliest possible stage, not right at the last minute, not as the reward for all our hard work over however many generations, but right from the get-go. And if we do that, we'll actually accelerate development. The more free we are, the more we're achieving the goal of freedom, which is the goal of development. So it's self-fulfilling. It's truistic to say the earlier we give people freedom, the, m the quicker we'll become developed because freedom is development. And he wrote a book which is called Development is Freedom because that's basically his argument. Although I'm doing him a grave disservice. Yep. Isn't, uh, doesn't the model of Chinese development contradict that message? No, because he, he would be arguing that China's not developing, right? not in the meaningful sense. That the fact that China's got lots of stuff doesn't make it any more developed than saying China has lots of rocks because the definition of development is based on freedom. And so having lots of non-freedom things does not make you developed. It just makes you full of those non-freedom things. So he would look at China and say, wasted opportunities. Right? They're holding themselves back from the thing they want. And it's not a surprise right, that he's Indian and not Chinese. Right? Because what you've got in India is a lot of freedom. What you don't have is a lot of stuff. <laughs> right, so it's not surprising that, they, that he comes from that view, right? But I'm going to come back to Sen because I actually think he sits in the spectrum, right? I actually think he's the middle ground because he doesn't fundamentally disagree with the core of what the outcome is, right? He still thinks that the destination of the orthodox school is about right. 
but he believes in free markets, he believes in private investment, he believes in the need for corporations and for foreign investment. He believes in all those things. He just thinks they're there to support political and civil and social freedoms. But he still thinks you need them. And so his method, his journey is different, but his end goal is you know, only slightly different than the others. But there is a different approach which fundamentally challenges the whole premise of the orthodoxy, right, which is what's sometimes called the basic needs or the human development approach. It goes by lots of names. Right? And what that is saying is that the aim, the objective of development is to give people their basic needs, to elevate them out of poverty. Right? That having lots of stuff is not the end point. It's not even the goal. Now, why is that the case? Because a country or a society or an economy that has lots of stuff might still have lots of people living in poverty, and so it's not developed. And here we're going to switch debates, and I hope Gemma watches this video because I'm going to rag on one of her favourite economists. Right? Here we switch to the debate between Paul Collier and others. Right? Paul Collier wrote a book called The Bottom Billion, right? which is a good book. You should read it. It's very interesting. His argument is that of the bottom billion poorest people on earth, right? so the poorest one-sixth of the population of the world, give or take, live in the poorest countries. They're concentrated in the least developed countries. Now, that might seem like a kind of no-shit thing to say, right? Like, poor countries are full of poor people. Right? How does he get 600 pages out of that? Right? But, it, but he does, right? And it's good. It's well written. He's a good author. Right? But not everybody actually agrees that that's true. Right? And more recent analysis by places like the Institute for Development Studies have said that if you look at the poorest 1.3 billion people, which is essentially the bottom six, because we've moved on a bit from the, the studies that Collier was using, which were mainly taken in the 90s, that of that bottom 1.3 billion, only a quarter of them are found in the world's poorest countries. The rest are found in mostly middle-income countries. So what does that mean? It means if you want to focus on alleviating poverty, you have to go looking for poor people, not just poor countries. Because the poor people aren't just in the poor countries, they're everywhere, because we haven't achieved full development in rich countries, even though we say we're developed, we're not, because our countries are still often chock full of poor people. Yep. What happens to the other? No, no, one sixth of the world's population. These are the bottom poorest, right? So it's, it's those who live on, they use different metrics, but the Institute for Development Study uses those people who live on $1.25 US a day or less. They're the poorest sixth of the world's population. Every, the other five sixths all earn $1.25 or more. Right? But just think about that. We're not talking about relative poverty, right? We're not saying that, yeah, there are poor people in Australia and there are poor people in Zimbabwe, but actually those two people have very different lives. This study is saying that there are people who live on $1.25 a day or less in middle-income countries. And some of them live in high-income countries. Some of them live in places like Australia. And you're wondering, who are those people? Well, go visit an Indigenous community and you'll find that there are people there living on the same kind of standard of material wealth, which is to say non-material wealth, that you find in the poorest countries on Earth. So how can a country like Australia be developed if it's chock full of people who we would consider live the lifestyle of the least developed countries on earth? What's with our model of development that it allows that? So that's an argument, the basic needs approach is a fundamental challenge, not just to the destination, but to the journey as well. But others, which we'll see in a sec, can largely accept the destination, but fundamentally disagree on the journey. And that's what I'm going to focus on for the remainder of tonight, but I want to make the point, because it was very relevant to the last series of debates you did, that you shouldn't just agree to the destination without thought. This is what your prep time is for. Right? It's for making strategic decisions about your case. And the more experienced you get, and the more skilled you become, the less your prep time is about telling each other arguments, the more it's about preparing your case in a strategic way. Because you can trust your teammates to know the kinds of arguments to make. So you don't have to explain them to each other in huge amounts of detail. You can say, OK, we're going to make the basic needs case. So what are the kinds of arguments we need to make? We need to make A, B, C and D. Can you make A, B and C and I'll make D in the second speech? Right, good, let's do that. Right, and you go off and prep it. You don't need a huge amount of time arguing with each other. Also because you've done a lot of preparation before the tournament. That's one of the things that marks the best teams. Is they're ready, right? They've got just add water cases ready to go. They know how to argue development cases where you accept the orthodoxy. And they know how to argue development cases where you don't. 
And so they just adjust that to the specific topic, but they've learned the first principles, so they know what they need to do at a core level, and so they're just adding the icing on top. Okay, so is everybody comfortable with that idea that there's an orthodoxy and you're perfectly acceptable to, to take it? And you, probably nine out of 10 debates about development, you will accept the orthodoxy, either because the topic requires it or because tactically it's the easiest thing to do. But you don't have to, and your opponents don't have to. So you need to know what they might do so you can at least take a bit of time to think about what you'll do if they don't follow the rules which you think they're going to follow. The debate flips from being one where you didn't think you had to explain why your destination was the right one to suddenly one where it is. You need to be ready to do that. All good? Okay, let's go on to the, back to the intermediate first principle spectrum because this is the spectrum of orthodoxy. Right? I'm not going to put the basic needs argument in here because I think it confuses things. Right, we're going to just stick with the orthodoxy cases because that's where the vast majority of this stuff goes. So, uh, actually, just before we do that, just for the sake of uh, you know, making that last point clear, um, let me give you some examples of some topics where either you would be required to or you might choose to um, challenge the orthodoxy on development. So, just some random examples um, that we should cease all government funding for Indigenous outstations. Right, anyone know what an Indigenous outstation is? Yep, go for it. Uh, so they're not, they're not in townships as such, but they're sort of like really small villages that exist in ancestral homelands for an individual indigenous population. And we're talking like 50, 60 people on government services and all that stuff. Right. So it was part of what was called the homelands movement in the 70s, largely, the start of the 70s, right, where, where indigenous people left the town camps, which are the kind of um, effectively the slums that many indigenous people live on on the edges of main cities, places like Darwin and Alice Springs. Right? because they were full of crime and drugs and there wasn't very much else there into the way of opportunity, violence, and they moved back to ancestral homelands. Right? They call them outstations. Uh, you know, uh, usually they're very small groups, largely singular extended family groups, uh, and you know, they live out in those areas. And of course, by definition, they're in the middle of freaking nowhere. Um, they're not exactly places where there's huge amounts of economic opportunity. In fact, it's nearly impossible to have paid employment. So how do those people survive? Well, partly through subsistence living. You know, they, they provide for themselves. Um, but also through a degree of government support. So um, that includes things like the Flying Doctor Service and School of the Air so the kids can get a basic education by radio and all sorts of other government payments and support programs. Right? And there's a big debate, and former Federal Minister Amanda Vanstone was the last one who had a crack at this, where she said, outstations are cultural museums which we should be closed. Right? That people living in these primitive tribal conditions with no prospect of ever getting serious employment, no prospect of ever owning their own home, of living, of advancing themselves, of their children getting a higher education, that shouldn't be allowed. Right? In a country like Australia, that should not be allowed. And we're allowing it to happen because we're supporting it and we're therefore encouraging it, and we shouldn't do it. Now, perfectly fine, have the debate. But one side of that debate is going to have to argue why it's okay to live like that. And you can't do that with the orthodoxy on development because it just fundamentally doesn't allow it. Right? The orthodoxy says that's wrong. The orthodoxy says that's step one of Rostow's five steps. Right? You're miles away from the outcome. You've got to do some shit pronto. Right? So if you're going to defend that, you need a totally different intellectual framework. And something like the basic needs approach can do that because, for example, indigenous people who live in outstations overwhelmingly have far better uh, health and life expectancy indicators than people who live in town camps. Why? Because town camps are horrible, violent places where basic services are actually pretty poor. So the chances of being in, uh, engaged in an assault, the chances of being an alcoholic, the chance of having frequent access to drugs, the chance of contracting communicable diseases, especially sexually transmitted diseases, are all radically less. And so life expectancy in the homeland is actually higher than life expectancy uh, in the, the town camps. Right? But that's it, right? Those people's kind of quality of life has basically plateaued. It's probably not going to get any better. Is that acceptable or not? That's the debate. But you need that alternative view. Something like uh, that Brazil should tear down the favelas, right, which is going to be a big debate in the lead up to the World Cup. Anyone know what the favelas are? The unregulated housing, mass slums in various parts of Brazil's major cities controlled by drug cartels. Yeah, they're slums. They're mass slums that operate, that, that exist right in the heart of major cities. In fact, it's one that's right next to the main, um, the main World Cup venue, 
which the government was going to bulldoze, right? But because of mass protests, decided not to. So you're going to see it on TV if you like soccer. You're going to see a lot of it, I imagine. Well, maybe not. Maybe they'll, they'll put the cameras such that you don't see the huge sprawling slum that several hundred thousand people live in. But if they pan back for a split second, you're going to see it because it's right there. It's right next to the stadium. Right. Now, again, some people would say slums are the very image of the thing that's got to go. Slums are a terrible, terrible thing. Fair enough. Totally fair enough. They're obviously pretty bad. I don't want to live in a slum. I don't think anyone in this room wants to either. But the question is, what's the alternative, right? And in every country, because almost every country has gone through this, England did it, for example, during the Industrial Revolution, every country that's cleared slums, those people have moved on to places that were further away from capital cities. So therefore, further away from services, further away from jobs, further away from the communities and the social networks that they knew. So that generation of people generally aren't that much better off. Why they always move further out of town? Because that's where the cheap land is, right? The whole reason why you clear the slum is that so you can then build you know, middle and high class housing in those areas which attracts more um, taxation, which the government can then use to provide more services. It's a very neat theory, except for those people who get moved on. Yeah, I mean, it does lead to urban sprawl and all those things. Yep, so there's a variety of arguments, but on the clear, on the kind of development grounds, um, you know, there are a lot of people who defend the favelas and say, actually, what we're, what we're trying to do in urban development is give poorer people more access to the kind of services that inner urban people have. Right? We want them to have the transport and the health and the education, right? But we can't do it because land values are so high in inner city areas that you can't afford to buy enough land and build enough housing to support those people, so they end up being on the fringes of society. So, you know, it cuts, it cuts both ways. But you're absolutely right. It does lead to more time. And the last example I'll just give you is um, that international organisations should not fund mega dams in developing countries. Right? This is a, the mega dams debate. It's an ongoing one. It's never gone away. It's not just about China. There's debates about, you know, Vietnam and Laos wanting to build dams and Egypt wanting to build dams and Brazil wanting to build dams and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And again, it's a trade-off, right? You might argue, yep, we know what we're doing with these dams. We're trying to get to the advanced state of development, but this isn't the way to do it, right? That disenfranchising those people isn't the way to go. We'll find another way to provide that economic outcome. And the other side of it says, no, that's actually not what we want. The aim of development is not to move people off their, their ancestral lands. It's not to break their connection with their cultural past, right? It's about providing services to people. And if we can't do it in a way which doesn't protect their quality of life, then why are we doing it at all? Okay, let's move on. So, um, one quick thing I'm not going to talk about much, but we're going to talk a lot tonight about, about economic measures of economic development, but development's not just about you know, um, economic numbers and wealth and GDP per capita. There's other, well, a whole bunch of other issues. There's a big one about rule of law right, and good governance. So there's lots of debates about whether or not good governance is an essential component uh, of development. And one of the things that we didn't really talk much about when we talked at the start about what's the definition of development is, what, apart from what the economic features of that society are, what are the political features of that society? And most people, I think, in the orthodoxy would argue that part of development is not just we're all really rich. Um, part of development is about certain kinds of political systems, right? And good governance generally is defined by things like the rule of law, property rights, access to justice, transparency, and democratic decision-making. If we don't have those things, you're not really advanced. You're not really a developed country. Now, that's fine. Those all sound really good, and good governance is like knitted into the fabric of all development programs now. Go on the AusAid website and type in good governance, and the like, search engine just explodes because every program is about providing good governance and measuring good governance and creating good governance and supporting good governance. Right, but what does it really mean? And if you go through that list, right, it seems like a pretty good list rule of law, property rights, access to justice, transparency, democratic decision making. But again, do we think that Western advanced countries have all of those things? I mean, let's look at the US, right? Does the US have the rule of law? Well, I mean, Obama killed an American citizen with a drone without a warrant. Is that the rule of law? Probably not, right? Do we have access to justice? Well, if you're an American and you're rich, you've got tons of access to justice, <laughs> right? But even if you're middle income, the idea that you're going to fight out a big case in court is, like, crippling. Right? Do we have democratic decision-making? Well, I mean, America's not a dictatorship, but is it the kind of democracy you see on the West Wing? No. It's not, right? There's serious problems with their democracy. So before we go around telling people that this is the aim, we have to ask ourselves whether we've even achieved that aim at all if we're going to suppose that we are the model that other people are going to follow. But I don't have time to, uh, to dwell on that one. I was going to say you'll get lots of topics about things like tying aid to good governance uh, and other kinds of political outcomes. And again, those are debates about whether you agree on the destination and disagree about the journey or not. OK, let's do the last thing tonight. Intermediate first principles of the orthodoxy. So we're going to start. 
Let me see if I don't point with a pen. Uh, we're going to start here. Right. What's the first one? The first one is economic liberalism. Right. What is called in development jargon the enabling state. And this is the orthodoxy of the orthodoxy. Right. This is what all the international financial organisations, the World Bank, the IMF, the Washington Consensus, you know, USAID programs, everybody else. This is the model that they are trying to get developing countries to adopt because they argue that it's the best way to get from step one to step five. So what does the enabling state mean? It means one that's focused on broad-based economic growth and GDP as a metric of success. So a country is doing well, you can measure whether a country is succeeding in development if its GDP is going up. And then we talk about countries that have healthy GDP growth or anemic GDP growth. Right? We talk about GDP as being a measure of their health and their success. Uh, it's about wanting to exploit comparative advantages. Right? So it's about saying that even the poorest countries, even the most underdeveloped countries, have some kind of advantage, something that they have more than others. It might be natural resources. They might have oil or gas or diamonds or some other thing that is valuable. Well, they might not. They might have other kinds of resources like fisheries or timber. Right? They might have farmland which is increasingly scarce as the world's population increase. But they might have cheap labour. You might have a population that speaks a useful language, like English. Right? And there are plenty of call centres in poor parts of the world which are exploiting their comparative advantage, that they have English speakers who work cheap and other countries don't. They can charge the same amount. Whatever it is, you can go down the list, every country's got something, find it, invest heavily in it, use that as your engine of growth and then use that growth to fuel the other stages of development. But here's the critical stuff, right? It's about minimising the role of the state because you want to avoid crowding out private investment. Crowding out means if the government's in there sucking up all the capital, right, if governments are going to the banks and borrowing all the money and using that to build infrastructure, they're removing opportunities for the private sector to do that because banks are always going to want to lend to governments first because governments are less likely to default on a loan because they have powers of taxation. Right? So governments are less likely to default, so banks are going to want to lend to them. And so then when a private company comes along and says, can we borrow some money so we can build this important mega dam? The banks say, sure, but then we've kind of used up all our capital, so we'll have to borrow money from somebody else and then lend that to you, so you'll have to pay higher interest rates. And that higher interest rates makes the investment sometimes not worthwhile, so that investment doesn't happen. Also, if the state's going on a big building splurge, then all the resources, the human capital, all the you know, truck drivers and crane drivers and folks who have shovels, are all working on the government projects and you can't get them to work on the other projects. Right? Look at the WA under the mining boom, right, where people were being charged huge, people were being paid huge sums of money to do really basic stuff because the mining industry had just sucked in everybody who had you know, at least one arm and one good eye and could wake up in the morning. Right? You could get paid huge amounts of money. Right? You can have that effect with government too. Right? If governments go on huge spending sprees, they can kind of suck up all the surplus labour. Right. The enabling state says that's bad. You want the private investors to have access to your economy. So governments need to get the hell out of the way. And the way they do that is minimising their role. Uh, and when it comes to basic services, as much as possible you want to shift them to a user pay system. And by basic services I mean water, I mean health, I mean education, I mean electricity. You don't want to give that stuff away for free. Why? Well, for one, because when you give it away for free, people won't value it. They'll waste it. They won't use it efficiently. They'll get a culture of dependency, but they'll never be prepared to pay for it because they'll get used to the idea that we've never had to pay for this before, so why do I have to pay for it now? But also, if you've got that user pays incentive, then the private sector will come in to invest because there'll always be those users who can pay a bit more than other users and someone will figure out a way to make money off those people and they will invest and there'll be ancillary benefits of that investment. There'll be training and infrastructure and services and spin-offs. So you want to do all that stuff. You want to get the government out of the way. You want people to pay for that stuff. And the priority then for government spending is only that kind of infrastructure that encourages foreign direct investment. So build ports and build roads from that port to where your factories are. That's great. That encourages someone to build a factory at the end of the line. But that's it. Don't build the factory. Right? Let the private sector do that. Just build those things which will encourage investment, not replace the private investment. And you know, why do you do that? The bottom line of all this stuff is the benefits will trickle down. Yes, in the short term, the people who will make money in that system are those who are best prepared to exploit the opportunity to invest. 
So if you're living in a poor country, but you've got a bit of money because you're connected, right, or you live on land that's got oil under it, or you've got more skills than the average person, you're going to make out like a bandit. Right? You're going to do well. You're going to get the best jobs. You're going to get the best investment opportunities. You're going to do well. And some other people are not going to do well. But that's okay, because eventually your increased consumption, your increased wealth, your increased investment is going to fuel the need for more people to have work and for more people to get skills. And so that benefit's going to trickle down to them. And so you get things like what's referred to as the Kuznets curves, right, after another famous economist. And uh, Robert Kuznets, I think is his first name off memory, uh, Kuznets was arguing that inequality, economic inequality, as well as some other things, follow a kind of bell curve under development. So in the early years where a country starts to develop, inequality rises for that reason I explained before, because a small percentage of the population are best prepared to exploit that opportunity, others are not. Right? They're living in a village in the middle of nowhere, they've got no opportunity to make money off it. But as the economy grows, that rate of growth will start to slow down, opportunity starts to spread as the state becomes wealthier and can invest more in basic infrastructure, more and more people get opportunity, they take up that opportunity and inequality shrinks. And then he applied that same theory to things like the environment and he says in the early stages of development people damage their environment. Right? They chop down forests, they suck up oil, they drain wetlands, they pollute waterways, they do all kinds of bad shit. But that's what's necessary to get the momentum in the economy happening so that we can then get the growth we need to then get a middle class and get a level of development where people are beyond their basic needs and can start to say, OK, I can now decide that I would much rather protect this pretty set of trees than cut them down because I've got enough material wealth in the short term. But when people are desperately poor, they don't want that. They don't want a pretty forest. They want food. Now, that argument works fine and it works badly, right? But it's the core of this thinking. That, yep, some bad shit's going to happen, but it's got a bell curve out. Right? It's got to bottom out over time. OK, so what are the pros of the enabling state? Well, it's got good prospects for short-term growth, especially if you've got good comparative advantages. You'll get international institutional support. The IMF, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, all those other bodies will pour money into you if you follow this approach, because they think it's right. So you'll get heaps of cheap capital. And there are strong incentives for individuals to join the formal economy. That means there's strong incentives for someone who doesn't at the moment have any money or any means of generating hard currency because they live a subsistence living, Right? They farm their own food and they eat that, and that's about all they do. There's a strong incentive for those people to find a way to, get, to enter into the formal economy, which means they find a job that pays money. And if you look at a developing country like East Timor, there's a population, about half the country live in Dili, in and around the capital city, and they all obviously have kind of formal economy jobs of one kind or another. They work in a restaurant or they're a driver or they're an advisor or they're a cleaner or they're whatever. Right? They have all the jobs everybody else has. And then outside of the capital city, are all these villages and townships where hardly anybody is part of the formal economy. Right? People grow fruits and vegetables, and they trade them, and they might sell them for very small amounts of money. They might use for things like petrol or basic medicines or textbooks for their kids, but only in very small amounts, maybe a dollar or two a day would be their lifestyle. They're not really in the formal economy. But the more user pays you've got, the more incentives there are for people who want to access those services to find their way into the private economy. What are the cons? Well, the big risk is huge vulnerability for over-specialisation. If you take your comparative advantage and you say, there's one thing that we do really well, we've got oil, or we've got forests, or we've got cheap labour, or whatever, we can grow lots of food, we've got good soil. If you fit, focus on a small number of things, then you're at the mercy of the fluctuations of the value of that thing. So there were lots of African countries in the 70s that had followed models of specialising in commodities, right, in growing food crops. And when the oil crisis hit in the 70s and Western economies took a dive because the price of oil exploded and cost of living increased dramatically and people started cutting back on their spending, the value of those commodities imploded and poor countries slumped back into huge debt because they could no longer export their primary commodity. They couldn't make foreign capital, they couldn't pay their loans, they got themselves in big trouble. And that was because their economies were too singular, right, they weren't able to deal with shocks by being diversified. You also get the risk of, uh, of, of oligarchies, right, which comes about when you privatise too quickly. And if you read Joseph Stiglitz's book, Globalisation and its Discontents, you'll get a long version of this argument where he focuses mostly on Russia, 
where he says, what went wrong in Russia is not that they privatised, because Stiglitz is, again, he's an orthodox economist. He's in favour of the private market and all that good stuff. So he thinks that privatisation should have happened, but he says it happened way too early. Right? It happened just after Russia emerged from communism. There were very poor government institutions. There were no oversight mechanisms. There were bad laws and regulations. And so it meant that corrupt deals were done. And these services weren't sold to the people who were best able to manage them. They weren't even sold to people who had the most money. They were sold at bargain basement prices to friends of the regime. And that's a massive defrauding of the, pop of the public. That's taking an asset which should have been sold for their greater good in terms of the wealth you generate from selling it and the efficient management of that service going forward. That should have been the cornerstone of their development, but they were robbed. Right? That's Stiglitz's basic argument, and that's the risk when you go down this path too soon in an in a emerging democracy or a weak democracy. Uh, and of course, a low regulation environment, a small government hands-off environment with you know, weak government institutions is just disaster waiting to happen for things like the environment, cultural rights, uh, indigenous rights, those kind of things, because of course those people don't have a state to be protected. So what's the case study for this model? Okay, I told you we're going to focus on India. So the key case study is Gujarat. Right, Gujarat is the model of the, of the state in India which said, we want foreign investment. Right? We're going to do everything it takes to get foreign investors in here. We're going to do all the things that I just said. And the, uh, the guy who was running Gujarat state, who is now the just recently elected president of India, Narendra Modi, said in his first speech after being elected prime minister, said we should have no red tape in this country for foreign investors. We should have a red carpet. <laughs> and that sums it up, right? He's a perfect model of that first type of intermediate first principles. So if you want to know who you are in a development debate, in a lot of those debates, you're going to be Nahendra Modi, Modi yeah. without the you know, killing of Muslims in 2002. Right? Just, the, <laughs> just, the, just the being nice to foreign investors side. Right? That's the example. Let's go on to the opposite side. Right? Like I said, it's always easier to identify what the alternative is once you've discovered what one part of the spectrum is. And so the alternative here is the development state. This is the idea that, funnily enough, all those things I just said are wrong. That the government should have a big role in development. A massive role, not just a supportive role, a lead role. That the state should coordinate the process of development and it should actively participate in it. That the state should build the industries it wants, not just wait and hope that the private sector will come and deliver them. So, what does that look like in practice? Well, it says firstly you're either going to have a lot of state-owned industries, where the government literally runs and builds those industries, um, or you're going to have deals where the state protects certain private players who run those industries in exchange for them being run along the lines the government want them to be run. So, South Korea is a good example, right, where um, the POSCO entity, which was uh, once upon a time the world's largest manufacturer of steel, was a government-owned entity, right? The government just built it in the 50s. It said, we need tons of steel if we want to have modernisation. We want to build factories and roads and skyscrapers, and for that we need steel. And I'd rather buy steel we make here than buy it off them. So we're going to make steel. So they borrowed money and they built the factories and they trained the workers and they created an absolutely mammoth company, which then in the you know, 1990s was sold off at a phenomenal profit, right? having been a huge part of Korea's industrial development. But there are also these privately owned entities called the Chabels, right? big private companies that were involved in things like manufacturing cars, manufacture, you know, aerospace manufacturing, other kinds of technology, you know, companies you've heard of like Hyundai and Daewoo, right? that were private companies but which operated in a kind of sheltered environment right? where the government said, we're going to protect you from foreign, in, from foreign competitors, we'll even protect you from some domestic competitors, but in exchange for that, you play on our team. So you need to employ shitloads of people. You need to be part of our training programs. You need to pursue the kinds of products and services which we think the economy needs. And in exchange for that, you can get rich. And so the classic model for this historically is the Asian tigers. So it's Korea, Taiwan, Japan, Singapore, right, which all pursued that line. But in the uh, modern context, to take out the Indian example, the development state model is Karnataka state, right, which is in the south west of India, which is where Bangalore is. Right? Everyone's heard of Bangalore. It's where the Indian government said, it would be really nice if we were a world leader in IT. So let's do that. Let's build a bunch of IT universities and fly in foreign expertise to train our kids in everything to do with IT. And then we're going to provide cheap loans from government banks 
to government entities to build telecommunication uh, and other IT-based industries. And it's phenomenal success, right? It's the Indian, Indian Silicon Valley. But it didn't happen by accident, and it didn't happen by foreign investors, and it didn't happen by the government just building roads and ports and saying, here you go, decide what to build here. It happened because the government said, this is what we want. And so, the model, the, you know, if you want to know who you are in this debate, if you were uh, Narendra Modi in the previous example, in this one, you're the Korean economist Harjun Chang. Right? Look up his books if you want the full version of this argument. But Harjun Chang is probably the most famous at the moment. He's an uh, um, Oxford or Cambridge, I can't remember, educated guy, worked with Joseph Stiglitz to, on his um, dissertation, and has now written a bunch of books saying, let's be clear about this. When it comes to development, there's only ever been one model that worked. It's the model that the West used, and it's the model that the East is going to use as well. And that's massive government intervention. Sorry, can you spell that? Harjun Chang, yep. Uh, H A dash J O N Chang, C H A N G. So his book, um, Bad Samaritans, is probably the most famous. Uh, although I think he's got one called Pulling Up the Ladder, which again kind of tells you everything you need to know about his philosophies on life. So, what are the pros of the development state? Well, the first pro is it diversifies the economy. It says we're not just going to rely on what our natural advantages are, we're going to build our natural advantages. We're going to tell ourselves what our advantages are, and we're going to go out and create them. Uh, it also promotes more equitable growth because it doesn't just say, okay, there are some people in our society who are well prepared to exploit the opportunities of development and the others will catch up later. It says, what are we going to do for those other people? What kind of industries, what kind of employment, what kind of jobs can we create for them now? And if that means we have to educate them to have skills they didn't have before, then that's what we'll do. If it means you have to build infrastructure that no one would economically build in those places, then that's what we'll do. If it means you have to subsidise the hell out of a business until it gets off the ground, then that's what we'll do. But we want to make sure that no one gets left behind. What are the, uh, and I guess the, the, the best pro really is it provides a transition path, right? The risk of comparative advantage thinking is you never get to graduate to something else. If your comparative advantage is cheap labour, what do you do when you don't have cheap labour anymore? If your comparative advantage is oil and gas, what happens when it runs out? Right, what's the plan? How do you invest in the next thing and the next thing if you don't have the state doing it? What are the cons? Well, the big one is the potential for authoritarianism. All those countries I named, Singapore, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, none of them were even remotely democratic when they went through their big booms in development in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Right? Korea was actively a military dictatorship. Right? The former general's daughter is now the president. So you can see the pervasive effect that that dictatorship has had. Even though they have elections and they have political parties and all that stuff, they haven't quite got over that stuff yet. Right? Taiwan had 50 years of one-party rule. Right? Only just in the last decade has experimented with the idea of having, letting some other guys have a go. Singapore has never let anybody other than the one-party rule and shows no prospect of ever letting them do it. Right? Singapore's not a brutal military dictatorship like Korea was. They didn't roll tanks down the streets and tear gas people. They just bankrupt you and lock you up and hound you out of the country if you challenge them on even the smallest grounds. Right? The Singaporean government is so intolerant of dissent that there's barely a handful of opposition MPs in the entire parliament. Because A, no one would be dumb enough to put their hand up to run for office against the Singaporean government. And if you were, the Singapore government makes sure you don't last very long. And they have a great law which says you have to be a fit and proper person to be, a, to be a member of parliament, which Australia has a version of that too. And part of the definition of fit and proper is that you've never declared bankruptcy. So what do you do if you're the government and you've got a pesky opponent and you really want to get rid of them but you don't want to shoot them in the head because it's messy when Obama's visiting next week? Right? You just pursue them with vigorous defamation legislation. And you, one way or the other you bankrupt them. Either the court, which are not terribly free, decide that that what we would call legitimate political criticism was defamation and levies a massive budget-shattering fine, or their legal fees just mount up to the point where they sell their homes and everything else and collapse. But either way, they go bankrupt and then they're out. You don't have to worry about those suckers anymore. Or you can do what the, the uh, Singaporean government did a few elections ago, which was explicitly tell people, because 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing, that you can tell people that districts that don't vote for the government automatically go to the bottom of the list for maintenance and infrastructure upgrades of their homes. So, 
They don't shoot people, but they get the job done. So that kind of state-driven development model might be a great economic model, but there are very few examples of it happening in a democratic way. But because we're talking about India, I've given you one. Kanataka is a good example. Bangalore is a great success. It's not a perfect democracy in India, but it's certainly not the military dictatorship of South Korea. So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with the middle position. Now, remember that in the vast majority of debates, you're going to be either here or here, because those are the cleanest, easiest clashes. Right? And the debates that we just did, the topics that we just did, were really versions of that clash, the vast majority of them. But there is the middle option, and you can take it if you want, and the middle option is a march of Sen, right? The middle option is Sen who says, no, the purpose of it's not a question about whether the government gets involved or not, because Sen doesn't think the government should get overly involved in economic development. Sen thinks the government should focus on social and political development. Right? That the role of the government is to, as quickly and aggressively as possible, provide people's basic freedoms and needs. So the government should invest heavily in education, heavily in health services. Right? It should do everything it can to tackle inequality. It should try to remove gender biases and racial biases. Right? It should be tackling those lack of freedoms at that level. Not building industries, let the private sector do that, but smoothing the process out by making sure that people have those basic rights. And so Sen's favourite place uh, is Corella State, which is right next to Kanataka State. And Corella State is the poorest state in India by most measures, but in the last 10 years has gone through a dramatic improvement in its kind of human um, progress indicators. So the UN has a thing called uh, the, the Human Progress Indicator, right, which doesn't just measure how wealthy people are, it measures their, uh, their access to clean water, access to healthcare, levels of education, levels of literacy, life expectancy, blah, 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 blah. And um, Corella is killing it. Right? Most other states in India would beg to have even half the level of growth in basic measures that Corella has had. But it's had slower economic growth than Gujarat. And there's many other issues as well. It's not perfect. It's not a wonderland. But if you had to choose between living in Gujarat or living in Corella, I think it's a tough choice, right? If you're the kind of person who's got skills and is well-placed to operate in a free, free an open economy, then Gujarat's the place for you, right? If you're the kind of person who's got the resources and the education to start a business, then yeah, you probably want to be in Gujarat because it's bugger all red tape, just red carpets, right? But if you're the kind of person who doesn't have those things, if you're illiterate, if you live in a village, if you're from a minority group or you're a woman, you're much likely to be better off in Corella than you are in Gujarat. So which one do you choose? Well, that's the debate. But that's it, right? Those are the three philosophies. You're either going to be Modi, or you're going to be Sen, or you're going to be Harjun Chang, or some version of them, right? There's various versions of them, but they're all the same. You're going to take those philosophies against each other, unless you choose to disagree with the destination. Right? Then you're going to be a basic needs person. But that's it. Right? In those debates about how do we get piss poor countries to be rich countries, those are the options. Now, if we had more time, I'd do advanced purse principles, and I'd tell you that the last thing I said was a lie, and there are more options. But at a basic level, or at an intermediate level, to be precise, that's all you need, right? If you can get your head around those three ideas, and ideally those four ideas, including basic needs, then you are ready for a huge number of development debates, for dozens and dozens and dozens of topics, which are all just variations on a theme whether they're general or focused on a specific country, whether they're looking at the trade-off between economic development and the environment, or the trade-off between economic development and political development, which is what the last topic was about, right? or whether they're looking at what the right way of developing is, or what the role of the international community should be in fostering development, whether it's aid or programs like the IMF and the World Bank. I could go on and on, right? Dozens and dozens of topics, but they're all just those four options. And at their core, they're all one of two things. They're debates about the destination or they're debates about the journey. That's it. So if you can get your head around that and you can just do a little bit of research, it's not going to take you your whole life to learn those four things in enough detail to explain them, then you're ready. You're ready for a shitload of debates. That's first principles. Questions?
it, it does a little, except that Sen in particular... I mean, I, I, I actually kind of had a big debate with myself about where to put Sen on the spectrum, and originally I had him as actually advanced first principles, but I think you need to use him more frequently than that. Ultimately, when you boil it down, Sen's really agreeing with the, with the de destination that Gujarat wants to get to. He just thinks that the best way to get to that state of high development, high opportunity, high consumption, all that stuff, is to start from freedom and work up. Right? So if you want to play it out, the reason, part of the reason why I picked Indian examples is because two books were released last year, one that makes the first argument and one that makes the second argument in the Indian context. Right? So the second one was, unsurprisingly, Amartya Sen's most recent book, uh, right? which is called An Uncertain Glory, right? which talks about how the Gujarat model has failed. And while he's very critical of a number of things that happen in Corella, he doesn't think it's perfect, of course. It's a government that has huge problems in a, a whole variety of ways. He thinks it's far better to be in Corella than it is to be in Gujarat. And what the government of India and of different states and what other developing countries should learn is that you should do more of the good things that are happening in Corella and squeeze out some of the bad things that are happening. And on the other side um, uh, is, a, is a book that was written uh, again a year ago called um, Why Growth Matters, which is by another Indian economist who hates Amartya Sen, <laughs> who loves the Gujarat model, right, who writes a whole book about why it's getting the government out of the way, not just the government as an economic player, which is point number three, but government interfering as a social player, which is number two, getting them out of the way leads to the fastest amount of growth and Gujarat is the model that we want. So if you want to see the debate, it's right there. It's right there in 800 page book form and you can break it down into as much detail as you can, as you can swallow. Um, but I've tried to do the quick version tonight. But you're right, like Sen's a slightly awkward fit on that spectrum because he, he's got some sympathy for the basic needs crowd. But the difference is this, right? The basic needs guys are arguing that once you've got your basic needs, you don't necessarily need to go any further, but that that's sufficient. So to go back to the example I used, if you look at the indigenous kind of um, outstations and homelands, the basic needs crowds would say, that's enough. Like, we should do what we can to make it a bit better for those people, but in simple terms, that's enough. We shouldn't see it as a bad thing, that that's effectively the, the edge of their progress. But Sen would say, fuck no, like, they can do a lot better than that. You know, they should have all kinds of opportunity. They should have the opportunities of education and proper health care and a chance to pursue what they want. I mean, Sen's phrase in Development as Freedom is, people should have everything they need to live a life which they have reason to value. Right? Which is a nice phrase. Right? So, He'd want to go further than the homelands crowd, more in the direction of the orthodoxy, but he might stop a bit short of the full orthodoxy. Yeah, um, sorry, who wrote the book that made the argument for position one in Lyons of Cole? His name's gone out of my head. Uh, he famously wrote another book that I'm trying to remember, which is, a, which is the classic book on why free trade, even in developed countries, is good. Um, I'll remember his name in a sec. As soon as I stop thinking about it, I'll remember it. But uh, if, you, if you Google uh, Amartya Sen and Uncertain Glory and any review of it, they will all talk about the massive like, Indian nerd brawl between the two Indian economists who are both like, they're both old men, like Sen's 87 or something, right? Like they're, they're both octogenarians or older. They've both been hurling abuse at each other for like a very long time. Um, and, and the third one, I mean, the, there's, there's a great argument for the basic needs crowd, which comes from another Indian economist um, named uh, Pravin Dasgupta. And Dasgupta says, they're both crazy, right? They're both totally fucked up, right? Sen's there saying, isn't it great that people in Corella uh, have high life expectancy, right? Like, isn't that, isn't that fucking awesome, right? That their life expectancy has gone up from, like, you know, 30 to 32. Like, ooh, that's great, right? But what we're not measuring is the social damage that we're doing to achieve economic growth, right? So Dasgupta's argument, because he's a basic needs guy, right, is that when we're obsessed with GDP, what we forget is that GDP, like the G in GDP is the problem, right? The G is gross, right? Gross means without taking out the other things, what is the total domestic product of this country? But we don't get an accurate view if we don't take the other things out. So the classic example that, you know, uh, Dasgupta likes to use is, if you drain a wetland to build a you know, chicken shop, GDP goes up. Because someone got paid to build it, someone will get paid to work there, someone will get paid for the chickens that get sold, and someone will get paid to mop the floors. So GDP goes up. But what did we lose when we lost the wetland? What is the economic value of that? What is the social value of that? How has that affected people's lives? 
Not just in an airy fairy way, like, oh, they don't get the wetlands look at, but what if they derive some of their food from that wetland, right? What if that wetland charged through aquifers which provided the fertility of land further downstream which allowed other farmers to exist? Right? Why are we not measuring that harm? So India is a great example, right? It's got almost a sixth of the world's population and 4% of the world's fresh water. Right? So how's it going to work, right? How are you going to have a population that's growing at huge volumes, water's kind of important, and the process of development that's happening in India at the moment is incredibly dirty. Like, mind-bogglingly dirty. Like, the number of fresh water sources that don't have a significant level of pollution is almost non-existent. Right? So, how's that going to go on? Like, there's plenty of people that argued that the war in Sudan was the first example of a war over water, right? It wasn't really a war over oil. Oil was the prize, but water was what triggered the conflict, right? Water was what got disparate clans living out in the desert to go to war with each other. But it's pretty hard to have a war in the Sudan, right? It's hot, it's big. It's not that easy to get lots of guns. You don't want to go to war just like on a fucking whim, right? Like, you don't think that shit through. But if you're going to run out of water, that's a pretty good reason to take up arms against your opponents, right? So how's India going to hold together with a huge population and bugger all water with the water they've got they're polluting? And that pollution of water doesn't count, right? It doesn't affect GDP because GDP is the gross output of the economy, not netting off the damage that's done to achieve that outcome. So, you know, the, all of those arguments just roll around in circles. Right? They all just chase each other's tails. It's just the same four arguments. So if you want, you can call the basic needs argument the, you know, the Das Gupta position, and you can look up his books. He wrote this book. Uh, it's got some horribly long name, and that gives you a real indication of um, just how hard it is to read. It took, it took me months to get through it. Uh, what's his name? No, I can't find it now. I scribbled it down here somewhere before. Oh, it's called An Inquiry into Wellbeing and Destitution. Right? It's, a, it's a cheery book. Uh, and, uh, and it's about famine, right? It's about why people starve to death. Right? Like, it's not, it's not something you, know, you give your mum for Christmas, but, like, <laughs> but like it's, a really, it's a really important book, right? And, and Sen's got an argument, right, which says that one of Sen's most famous arguments, the one that everybody remembers because it's the easiest one to explain, because development as freedom is really hard to explain until you've had it explained to you, but it's not obvious what development as freedom means. Uh, well, I didn't find it obvious anyway, maybe I'm dumb. But um, Sen's, well, I think Sen's most famous argument in development as freedom is there's never been a famine in a democracy. Right? So if you go back and check it out, there's never been a famine. I mean, I'm serious famine, not the cost of food went up. I mean, people starving to death. There's never been a famine in a democracy. And his argument is because all famines are preventable. Either they're, they're preventable environmentally, like they're preventable because you make sure you've got enough water and you make sure you protect your land from erosion and contamination and you make sure that you, uh, you know, protect farmland and farmers and don't let them all get killed or you know, hurtle off their land to build a dam or whatever. Like you prevent the thing that might cause the famine or you marshal resources to buy food from somewhere else and you bring it in. And in a democracy, that's what's got to happen, right? Because fundamentally people won't let themselves starve if they've got an option. Uh, like if they can vote you out, they will vote you out if it's a choice between that and eating. So in a democracy, it's pretty straightforward. A government's going to do everything it can right, to prevent that. But in a dictatorship, like, say, North Korea, you don't have to worry about that, right? People starve all the time. And the government doesn't have to worry about that because there's no option for those people. So it's fine. Right? But that's Gupta, because he's a basic needs guy, and says, you're not taking the whole picture into account, right? You think famine is just, is there enough food? But you're not asking the real question about why famines occur in the first place. And famines occur not just because nature decided it would be really hot in this place and therefore the crops don't grow. There's more than enough food, right? Das Gupta is one of those people who coined that phrase, which I think every debater learns at one point or other in time, which is when you're getting into a debate about aid and food and famine and starvation, at some point someone in the debate is going to say, the problem's not a shortage of food. There's more than enough food in the world. The problem is the distribution of food. And it's true, right? There's more than enough food in the world right now to feed everybody to their basic needs. So why do people starve to death? It's a problem of distribution. But it's not a problem of democracy. It's a problem that wealthy and powerful countries, if you want to look this up, this is Wallerstein and his world systems view, right? That wealthy countries have established an international economic order that puts them at the top at the expense of the bottom. Not just in relation to the bottom, at the expense of the bottom. That rich people are rich because poor people are poor. Right? Not just rich people are rich because poor people haven't got rich yet. And so if you think that's true, if you accept that model, 
then famines aren't just like a thing that happens. Famines are a thing which are inflicted on poor people. And so having this conversation about whether they're a democracy or not misses the point entirely. So they're all just the same versions of the debate, right? Just go round and round in circles. Should the government own businesses? Right? Should we privatise? What should the role be in infrastructure? How much should we put into aid? How much should we focus on democracy? How much should we focus on human rights? How much should we focus on the environment? It's the same four arguments every single time. Every single time. Okay. Any last questions? You've been very, very patient. I appreciate it. It's a lot to get through. I just, I want to make sure that I get this right so that I don't... Oh, exactly, because you have said it wrong. So when you... So your explanation about the United States and the developing states was all about how we get, essentially, to the similar destination, right? Yep. And then all this other discussion about the five states of development versus the basic needs arguments is all about what development a little bit confused. So the, the, enabling state, uh, the enabling state versus the development state are just arguments about how do we best move through the five stages. How, how do we get out? Because it's not so easy just to say, okay, so at one point we're at stage one, which is a traditional society. You know, at one stage we're a poor African village and we have to get to the preconditions for investment. Well, how do we do that? Like, what is the mechanism to do that? And so one side will say the mechanism to do that is the government taking an enabling approach. So if you're a, a country like, you know, Ethiopia is a great example, and Kenya, great examples of, of countries in the Rift Valley and the Horn of Africa have tons and tons of poor people living in villages with basically no infrastructure. And so one of the things that they're looking at is building uh, a huge port right there in the Horn of Africa, a brand new shiny spanking port there. Why? I mean, ports don't feed people. Ports aren't going to educate the people in those villages, not going to ensure that women in the villages don't have female genital mutilation inflicted on them or aren't routinely beaten by their husbands or sold for cows. But the port is hopefully going to bring in foreign investors. The investors are going to say, this is a great port, right? This is a port where we can cheaply and easily move goods. So it's better for us to build our factory or to build our farm here than somewhere else with a crappier port where it's going to be more expensive or more time consuming to move our product from one place to another. So you've attracted that foreign direct investment. And so those players going in, they're going to build a factory. They're going to want workers. Some of those workers are going to need education. So the factory is going to provide it. Like, if you're going to build a factory and your workers need to know how to have a basic literacy level, then the factories will deliver it. Right? They just will. Because it's cheaper to teach a bunch of illiterate people the basics of literacy than it is to employ people in, you know, a first world country. So that's what you'll do, right? It's just the path of least resistance. It's just the cheapest option to get goods to market. So the, the first model says the way we answer the question of how we get out of stage one and into stage two is we enable foreign investment and then we get out of the way and we let the investors come in and do it. And the third approach says the way we get out of stage one to stage two is we directly invest in the things we want. We don't wait for foreign investment, we make it happen. And we assume the risk and the rewards of doing that. And then the third one says, well, yeah, right, like the fundamental problem is those villages are full of illiterate people. And there's no reason why that should be the case, right? A country like Rwanda has virtually eradicated illiteracy. It's not a developed country by any stretch of the imagination, but there's very little illiteracy. Why? Because the government went out aggressively to deal with that problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other last questions? I really, seriously, I appreciate the patience people have shown. It's really hard stuff. I know Gem is more fun at doing this than me. I apologise. You should watch her video too. It's very good. She'll teach you words about things, as she would say. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, folks. Good luck.